That's David Bowie, live in Santa Monica, California, October 20th, 1972, with, of course, the classic Ziggy Stardust. And he's backed up by the Spiders from Mars on that track. I guess you could say, by this point, David Bowie was Ziggy Stardust. And tonight we're honored to have uh, the drummer from the Spiders from Mars on the show with us, Woody Woodmansey. He played on Bowie's uh, The Man Who Sold the World album and Hunky Dory, The Rise and Fall of Ziggy Stardust and the Spiders from Mars, and also the Aladdin Sane record, and was right there in the thick of things when that music made history and spawned so much of what we would consider alternative music today from, like, you know, 77 on the modern rock era, I guess you could say. And Woody, I guess we could also say that the rise and fall of Ziggy Stardust and the Spiders from Mars is probably in the top 10 classic rock albums of all time. Yeah, I guess it is. Yeah, and you know, the funny thing is, the first thing anyone hears on it is you. Oh, the beginning of the yeah, album? Yeah, yeah. yeah that's, hey, I never thought of that. <laughs> yeah, that's true. And you know, I interview so many musicians on the show, and almost without fail, they hearken back to uh, the first time they heard... Bowie as their main inspiration for why they even have a career, you know, and it's always that period, the Ziggy Stardust record and also Aladdin Sane and Man Who Sold the World. Have you been aware that uh, the music you helped shape back in the early 70s, along with David Bowie, has had such a huge impact? I, I mean, I guess over the years that the amount of people I've met that, that have verbally said that to me, and then I've read, I've read articles in magazines, you know. Uh, Chad Smith from Chili Peppers learned drums by learning Ziggy Stardust. And I was like, whoa, you know. <laughs> so there's, there's been a few like that. But, um, I mean, when I was 14, that's kind of what I wanted. Mm -hmm. When I started drumming, um, I used to get on, the, get on the bus with a pair of sticks in my pocket, and the drunks on the bus would say, hey, kid, are you a drummer? And I'd go, yeah, are you any good? Yeah, brilliant. And I, I couldn't play. I just had the sticks, you know. But, uh, you know, when I looked at what am I doing, um, I thought, well, I kind of want to, it sounds a bit weird, this, but it, I kind of said to myself, I want to be in the next big thing that comes out of England. And then I kind of forgot that. You know, it was right. kind of just putting that there as a, yeah, that's what, and, and it, you know, as a 14-year-old kid who couldn't play, <laughs> that was uh, that was just a passing thought, and then it was year. It was actually after playing with David that I remembered. Hell, that's what I actually said I wanted. <laughs> well, that you... was quite spooky. Yeah, you can't beat that. Yeah. Right now there are two releases in a way. I mean, you've got your new project uh, 3D. Yeah. And there's also the recent reissue of the uh, Live in Santa Monica concert from 1972. Yeah. Um, which has got to be uh, a relief that that's finally come out officially because it's been uh, available as a bootleg for many years, and maybe that was irritating <laughs> to you. I don't know. But uh, now it's out and sounds great. Yeah, I actually haven't heard it yet. You haven't um, heard it yet? No, I haven't heard the, the, the remastering. Um, I mean, I had a copy of the bootleg. Mm -hmm. It was, uh, I mean, none of us really knew it was being recorded that night. Oh, they didn't tell you that it was going to be no, on the radio? No, we didn't know. <laughs> Uh, sneaky American radio. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but, uh, you know, luckily it was... A, in fact, I, I I really remember that night, you know, because it was one of those nights, you know, when it really... Everything clicks, and uh, you think, well, this is a good night. Sure. Um, so luckily, it got recorded. <laughs> yeah. And one of the interesting things I found out in, in doing research on you is that uh, we all know, uh, you know, you were in the band, Mick Ronson, Trevor Boulder, and of course, David Bowie. It's his band, you know, he's Ziggy Stardust, and you guys are the Spiders from Mars. But you worked with Mick Ronson in a band before you uh, hooked up with Bowie. Yeah, that's right. In the, in the north of England, we were in a band called The Rats. Um, we were the infamous band from the north. Um, well known. <laughs> Um, really doing, um, we were kind of learning our craft as doing the blues and, yeah. and, then, and then when, so we'd do Howling Wolf and, uh, Smokestack Lightning, things like that, uh, I'm a Man and do our versions, but we'd all kind of, the band had really got into where we got to play it really authentic. It's right. not, not a clean kind of. Uh, English version, we've got to be really in there and feel the blues, man, you know. Right, right. Uh, and it was good. It, it, it kind of taught you a song that it, if you could play the blues, it was such a good basic to get in. 
because if you could feel it, it worked. If you couldn't, it, nobody really stopped to watch you, you know. And then kind of Hendrix and Zeppelin and Cream with Clapton, those things were just coming through as progressive rock. So we kind of switched into that, and Mick, Mick could play... You couldn't tell it wasn't Hendrix playing. Right. And then he could do another track, and you couldn't tell it wasn't Clapton. Um, and then Jeff Beck, and he just... And he had all the different styles that were around. He had them down. And the whole band did that, really. It was how... How close can you get to playing like Ginger Baker, Mitch Mitchell? As we were doing um, university gigs, really, in London, in, in uh, England, you got kind of fed up of people coming coming up and saying, oh, man, you just you sound better than Zeppelin. <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> hey, hey, man, you, you sound just like Ginger Baker when you do your solo. You, and then, you know, at first you think, well, cool. And then you think, actually, that's not really where I want to be. <laughs> right. you know? So then we kind of started... We just really started writing our own stuff then, and then then Mick got the job with David down in London, so he moved down, and uh, I just I just replaced the drummer in the Rats, mm -hmm. um, and that drummer came down to London and was playing with David, and then Mick and David chatted and said, um, okay, the the drum area is not working out, and Mick said, well, Woody will come down. He's good, bloody blah. blah. <laughs> so he volunteered you. Yeah, he did. <laughs> uh, and then we just we all moved into Bowie's house basically for the first year. So you'd just get up in the morning, have breakfast, go downstairs, and you could rehearse and practice and make a noise, you know. So um, I'm guessing that Bowie, what he really wanted to do was toughen up his sound. Yeah, I mean, he, he was kind of a folk guitarist. I mean, before yeah. I joined him, that's I'd seen his name on a on a flyer for a festival. Uh, with the, with the uh, Afro hairdo, sure, yeah, <laughs> and uh, and because of what we we were into at the time, it it really didn't mean anything to us. And well, David phoned up and said, "I want you to come and join me and Mick." You know, um, my thoughts were, "Oh God, it's not folk music," <laughs> <laughs> but Mick said, "No, no, man, it's 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 harder. It's it's kind of I'm toughening him up, you know." <laughs> um, and it was, you know. Well, Bowie famously said that you, out of all the drummers that he's worked with over the years, and God knows he's worked with a ton of them, um, that you were the one who uh, gave him what he wanted. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, like he could trust you to know what to do. <laughs> yeah, yeah. With his songs. And the funny thing is, you know, the man who sold the world, uh, you can, I mean, the minute you guys join him, I mean, his sound changes radically because his first record in the 60s was the sort of, bizarre anthony newley thing yeah terrible yeah <laughs> which he hates and you know doesn't want reissued and i don't blame him yeah, yeah. and his uh, second album has space oddity on it but you're right for the most part that's like a folk record yeah and then you know then all of a sudden we get to she shook me cold <laughs> with of yeah. a circle you know it's like whoa what, what happened I'm, here yeah, yeah. <laughs> now hunky dory by the way is one of my favorite records Oh, cool. Yeah, Love that album, favorite. you know, and uh, such great songs. And you can hear where he's going on the next record on Hunky Dory. Yeah. Um, now, Ziggy Stardust, when he brought those songs in, you guys obviously would jam to them and work up an arrangement. Um, but at what point did he, you know, put you guys aside and say, look, um, here's the concept. I'm going to be from outer space. <laughs> <laughs> and you guys are, are going to be from outer space, too. And not only that... You're gonna you're gonna have to wear this. Yeah. 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 I mean, I kind of thought he was from outer space when I first <laughs> met him. <laughs> anyway, um, I mean, it was a gradual thing, really. Right. I think it was, um, you know, the, the the concept was building through the songwriting. I mean, he he didn't really discuss that that's what it was going to be ever with us, really. Right. It was just something that I guess the whole band um, understood. It was not something we kind of talked about. You you kind of went on stage. And to be honest, I think we all felt like we were from another planet. <laughs> you, you know? I mean, I know, I know the big thing's been made. David became Ziggy, bloody blah, blah. Right. But to, to pull off that part behind somebody like that, you couldn't be one of Oasis. Right. You, you know? You had to sort of be able to hold your position. Right, sure. Um on stage as a musician and as, as a person. And, and it was kind of a... We got into the theatrical thing by going to 
um, theatres in London to see the lighting to to look at what effects they had on different outfits that people mm -hmm. were wearing. Um, so the whole thing was approached not as a rock and roll thing, really. Right. It was really approached as a as a production, um, kind of ticking all the boxes. I mean, when we would rehearse, I would be sat behind so I could see what was going on stage, where they were moving, and I'd said, it looks really boring if you if you just start the number like that. Why don't you start leaning on each other and start the guitar and then push off as the band comes in? Uh, just things, little choreography sure. bits that... But we never thought it was choreography. It was just, well, let's just put a good show together. Well, uh, Bowie had a quote, um, I guess about a few years ago, where he said that you guys at first uh, weren't all that keen on the outfits. Yeah. But uh, he said once the girls started screaming, uh, every, you know, everybody was like, oh, okay, well. You know. Yeah, where's my, where's my new outfit? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, when, when he first um, told us, they brought material. They brought material to shows. Okay, this is yours, Trevor. This is yours, Mick. And this is what it will look like. And they actually brought them in. Mick packed his suitcase. <laughs> he, he just said, that's it, I'm leaving. And he was down at the station um, waiting to catch the next train to the north of England. And David said, oh, can you go handle him? Go and, you know, whatever you have to say, get him back. <laughs> so I had to go and sit on the station with him and, and basically took about an hour before I convinced him, like, let's give it a shot. <laughs> Well, but I mean, it, but it, yeah, it did get the girls screaming. I must admit. Yeah, yeah. I know it's one or two. <laughs> <laughs> one or two, right? Yeah. You know, thinking back to uh, that early glam period with with Bowie and T Rex and Roxy Music. I mean, not only were the outfits like from another planet, but also the music was so strange and so different from what was happening at the time. And what kind of resistance did you guys meet up with until eventually? I mean, I don't know what happened. You guys eventually got. Uh, the confidence. Yeah. I mean, when we, when we first started touring in England, um, we did very small gigs, and um, I would spend the night ducking beer bottles and, and beer cans, <laughs> and we were doing the same set. Right, sure. And the, and the whole front rows would be just giving rude sounds with their fingers. Right. And it was not safe. <laughs> <laughs> it was not, so we pulled off the road. We said, that's it, we can't go out there, somebody's going to get hurt. And then when, I think it was, um, it must have been Starman that started to chart in England. And then we toured again. You could, you know, you remembered some of the faces because they, right. they were pretty close in the small <laughs> place. And they were there with the thumbs up, you know. Ah, uh, okay. The, the same people. Um, you'd go down incredible at a gig where you, you thought, oh, I'm never going to play there again, you know. Right. Or in that town again. <laughs> so, um, yeah. Yeah. Well, you did four records with Bowie. You did Amanda Sold the World, Hunky Dory, uh, Ziggy Stardust, and then Aladdin Sane. Yeah. And then uh, Bowie announces on stage, and I don't know if this was a surprise to you guys at all, that that's it, we're not doing any more shows. I'm breaking the band up. It, it was at that time. You know, when he announced it, we didn't know he was going to announce that. But, um, you know, there have been a few a few discussions beforehand over the over the American tour really um, about what he was going to do next and what his plans were he kind of wanted us to go in the background more and then he was he was talking about doing soul music and doing covers which was pinups right right so there was a few things that were like well, okay well I don't really I don't really fancy that I don't really see that um, and I had voiced I'm not really into that earlier in the tour. Um, so when it when it came to Hammersmith and the announcement, it was it was a surprise that he said that. Right. But at the same time, I didn't. We didn't really know what it meant. Right. It was like, well, is this a publicity stunt? Um, you know, just to get headlines and uh, and withdraw from the scene for a bit. Mm -hmm. Because I think I think he was under a lot of pressure from being on the road that much. It was hard to write that much. I mean, he managed it with Aladdin Sane, but I think only just. 